we'll go directly to folks. What I think makes sense is I'll read everybody in. Um, I'm going to go straight to uh, our folks today to give openings on 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 yourselves, and then uh, I'll go to counselors for any questions or statements that they would like to make. So uh, we're going to go ahead and start now. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am City Council Ricardo Royo, Chair of the Committee on Government Operations. It is Thursday, March 9th, 2023, and we are here today for a virtual hearing on Docket 0319. Notice from the Mayor of the appointment of Vivian Leonard, Leonard as, the mem uh, as a member of the Municipal Lobby and Compliance Commission. Docket 0320. Notice from the Mayor of the appointment of Sammy Nabulsi as a member of the Municipal Lobby and Commission, or, or Compliance Commission, rather. And Docket 0321. Notice from the Mayor of the appointment of Vivian Lee as a member of the Municipal Lobby and Compliance Commission. Uh, this was referred to the committee on January 25th, 2023. These dockets were sponsored by Mayor Michelle Wu in accordance with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, modifying certain requirements of the open meeting law, relieving public bodies of certain requirements, including the requirements that public bodies conduct its meetings in a public place that is open and physically accessible to the public. The City Council will be conducting this hearing remotely and it is being recorded. This enables the City Council to carry out its responsibilities while remain ensuring public access to its deliberations through adequate alternative means. The public may watch this hearing live via uh, live stream at www.boston.gov city council TV or on Xfinity 8, RCN 2 or Fios 964. Uh, written comments may be sent to the committee email at ccc.go at boston.gov and will be made a part of the record and available to all counselors. If you wish to provide public testimony and have not signed up to do so, please email Christine O'Donnell at Christine O'Donnell, O-D-O-N-N-E-L-L, -L, -L, at boston.gov. For those giving public testimony, please make sure that the, your name is visible so that I may call on you. Members of the public will be promoted to panelists when your name is called. Please make sure that you click yes when prompted to join as a panelist. Uh, this morning, I'm joined by my council colleagues, Councilor, uh, Council President Ed Flynn, Councilor Kenzie Bach, and Councilor Michael Flaherty. Uh, dockets 0319, 0320, and 0321 are matters sponsored by the mayor pursuant to our authority from the City of Boston Code, Ordinance Chapter 2, Section 15, to appoint members of the Municipal Lobby and Compliance Commission. The mayor appoints the three commissioners. They serve coterminous with the mayor. The mayor fills any vacancies for the unexpired terms. The commission may create regulations for the administration of the lobbying ordinance. They can also investigate and make findings related to compliance with the lobbying ordinance. Uh, this hearing is an opportunity for myself, council call and council colleagues to hear from the mayor's appointees, Vivian Leonard, uh, Sammy Nabulsi, and Vivian Lee. Uh, as chair, I will allow my council colleagues to make opening remarks if they would like, uh, and I'm going to then turn it over to uh, appointees for introductions. Um, I think it probably makes more sense to have appointees uh, make introductions, and then I'll hand it over to my colleagues uh, in the order in which they've arrived. Uh, and so with that, we'll start with uh, Vivian Leonard, uh, then we'll go to Sammy Nabulsi, and then uh, Vivian Lee, if that works for everybody. Good morning, the floor is yours. Good morning, counselors. Thank you for having me this morning. As stated, I am Vivian Leonard, the former director of the Office of Human Resources um, for nearly 25 years and a lifelong resident of the city of Boston. I am honored that Mayor Wu has recommended uh, me for appointment to the Municipal Lobbying Commission, which I believe is crucial to ensuring transparency and accountability in terms of how business is conducted in a major metropolitan city, such as the um, city of Boston, which continues to thrive. As 25, after 25 years as a director of the Office of Human Resources, I realized that the rules of engagement are necessary um, in order to govern an organization as large and complex as the city of Boston. As such, the Office of Human Resources was responsible for enforcing policies, rules, regulations, and laws pertaining to employees. Therefore, I am acutely aware of what the work is um, expected of this commission and once again, I am happy to serve. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Leonard. Uh, Sammy Nabulsi. Uh, thank you, Chairman Arroyo, and good morning, uh, Councilors Flynn, Councilor Bach, and uh, Council Flaherty. Thank you very much uh, for, for having us today. My name is Sammy Nabulsi. I'm a, uh, an attorney here in the city of Boston. 
work at Rose Law Partners and my practice areas are focused on um, uh, land use, environmental, and real estate uh, permitting and litigation. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be with you today uh, and, I'm, and I'm honored and uh, pleased to be potentially serving again on the Municipal Lobby and Compliance Commission. I do want to extend my thanks to uh, Mayor Wu uh, for considering me for reappointment to the, uh, to the commission. I was, uh, by way of background, I was originally appointed to the Lobbying Compliance Commission uh, as part of its inaugural commission back in 2019. Uh, at the time by then uh, Mayor Walsh, and shortly after being appointed uh, to the commission by this body, I, I was elected chairperson and I've had the great pleasure and honor of working with uh, Commissioner Lee uh, and also cur currently C Commissioner Champion in the Office of the City Clerk and the Council President over the last few years to implement the original lobbying ordinance as part of the <clears throat> inaugural Lobbying Compliance Commission. Uh, I thought the summary that uh, the chairman gave at the beginning is a really great summary of what the commission does, but I want to spend a few moments uh, highlighting uh, the accomplishments that we made in the last few years and what we want to build upon if given the opportunity to serve again. Uh, as, as you noted, Mr. Chairman, under the lobbying ordinance, the commission is authorized and empowered to promulgate regulations to implement uh, the ordinance. The ordinance was the first time that the city of Boston had really taken a crack at uh, regulating and oversight of lobbying that occurs at the city level. Uh, and I think because of that, there was much, you know, um, clarification, explanation, and, and process to be developed. Uh, and over a series of public hearings that we held and robust public comment periods, uh, pleased to report that in January of 2021, we did uh, promulgate and enact a series of regulations that implement the lobbying ordinance from clarifying what it means to be a lobbyist to what is considered and what is not considered lobbying activity uh, to also defining a process for what it looks like if we actually enforce violations of the lobbying ordinance, the type of due process that is given to individuals uh, who might be um, uh, charged with violating the lobbying ordinance, opportunities to be heard, opportunities to appeal on what that process looks like before the lobbying commission. Uh, and of course, um, uh, we spent those regulations also giving the Office of the City Clerk additional support and clarity on how it implements the day-to-day -day functions of the lobbying ordinance. The second thing that we did is we worked on modernizing both how the lobbying ordinance works in the city and also uh, how the public actually has access to the information that is provided. Uh, we were supported by the Office of the City Clerk and the Department of Information Technology, both did a phenomenal job of making all applications and quarterly reporting electronic and actually publishing reports uh, and compliance on Analyze Boston so that the residents of the city of Boston can actually see uh, who is registered, what folks are lobbying about, uh, and who is in compliance and who is not in compliance. And I think that really goes to the spirit of the ordinance in the first place which is to bring sunlight to how business is done uh, at City Hall, both at the administrative, or I guess to all three, the administrative, legislative, and executive uh, level. The third piece of this is we really focused on education. We realize that the Office of the City Clerk carries a lot of functions. It's going to be difficult for a volunteer commission to know day to day who's complying and not complying. We realize that really when it comes to enforcement, it's our frontline, it's our frontline employees of the city of Boston. People who are setting up meetings, working desks, staff, who are meeting with external parties. And so we not only uh, did a round of education on what is lo what does the lobbying ordinance do? What does it mean? Uh, how can city employees assist? Uh, but we actually worked with the Office of Human Resources to now include that in annual uh, compliance training for city employees and we created an online complaint process. So if a city employee believes that someone is engaged in unauthorized lobbying activity, uh, they can actually report that uh, anonymously or you know, ind indicate who they are online to the city clerk and the office of the city clerk and the commission will then investigate whether there's in fact <clears throat> a violation of lobbying. And so over the course of the last few years, uh, the lobbying commission has been very busy, I think carrying out uh, the spirit of uh, of the ordinance and what it is intended to do. Uh, and if given the opportunity, I look forward to working with uh, Commissioner Lee 
and Commissioner Leonard, the Office of City Clerk and the Council President on uh, continuing this work and, uh, and hopefully uh, making the system work even better than it does today. I look forward to discussing my qualifications and uh, goals for the commission moving forward with all of you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Lee. Good morning, uh, Chairman Arroyo and City Council President Flynn and Councillors Bach and Flaherty. Uh, I'm very honored to be nominated to reappointment to the commission. I have lived in the Back Bay for more than 35 years and uh, was the former executive director of the Boston Harbor Association, which is a public advocacy group working on waterfront issues. Uh, I am the only non-lawyer on the commission and will, if my colleagues are appointed and reappointed, still be the only non-lawyer. So I come with a lens of public advocacy and also transparency. What will the commission's work do that will allow the general public to understand a lobbying interaction with city council and city agency and how can the public best access the information and as our current chairman of the commission sammy's already indicated we had spent a lot of time over the last now more than well, more, close to three nearly four years, I guess, um, working on first the regulations, but then also the actual implementation. We noticed over the course of those the initial period that there were things that, uh, in terms of technology, which Sam has already mentioned, that needed to be upgraded. It was, some lobbyists claimed it was not easy to access the reporting process, but more importantly, it wasn't as easy for the public to access the information as well. And we spent quite a bit of time figuring out basically what could be done. And as Sammy has indicated, we had a number of meetings and such. We think it really is at this point a much easier process. We were thrilled last month when we heard that compliance was 99.9%. .9%. We're waiting for one additional lobbyist to follow up with the paperwork. Um, but we have generally had very good compliance and certainly in the last, um, I would say nine months, we're seeing very good compliance, people understanding. And also we've developed a system where it is not so burdensome for the city clerk's office. In the beginning, literally every call, every lobbyist couldn't understand the process. What do the regulations mean? What do I have to do? Um, and we took the comments from the users, that is the, the lobbyists, together with general comments from the public about how they could access the information. And we think we've done a good job in terms of making it easy both for the lobbyists, but also for the general public. And we've done it in such a way so it's no longer as burdensome for the city clerk's office. So going forward, um, I think it'll be much easier for all the intended parties. And, you know, we really worked very hard since we were the inaugural commission to be sure that we followed both the letter and the spirit of the legislation that, that you all adopted. Um, and so I don't want to regurgitate what, what Sammy and, and, you know, Vivian have said previously, but I support everything that they've said. And hopefully, um, as we engage in conversation, we can talk a little bit more about what some of our future plans would be if we are reappointed or appointed and or appointed. Thank you so much. Thank you all uh, for, the, for your openings. Uh, I will just say, I do remember speaking with former Clark Feeney about those early days. And so uh, I'm really glad uh, to hear that we've sort of streamlined and made that process easier because I do remember those early days, it was right around 2020 when we first got elected or when I first got elected that those conversations were happening. And um, so I do, I do recall what you are speaking on. Um, I'm gonna go over to my colleagues in order of arrival, which uh, means beginning with Council President Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I also want to thank Sammy and Vivian, Lee and Vivian Leonard for the important work they're doing in the city on behalf of the residents of Boston. And the city is fortunate to have your professionalism, leadership, and integrity in this important, important body. And I had the opportunity to read and study your backgrounds. And I know you've worked hard in, in tremendous, tremendous asset to the city of Boston. 
for your professionalism and, and your integrity and um, just honored to work with you for, for, me, for many years. I know I haven't worked all that closely with Sammy all that much, but I, I have worked extensively with Vivian Lee and Vivian Leonard and um, just both, both women really helped make the city um, a better city, more welcoming city. So just wanna say uh, thank you to Sammy, thank you to Vivian and to Vivian um, for your important work, your important leadership. And Mr. Chair, I don't, I don't have any questions. Thank you uh, for being here, Council President Flynn. Uh, Councilor Bach, uh, followed by Councilor Flaherty. Thank you um, so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I have to say that I feel like the mayor's put together a really great panel here. Um, Vivian, you know, I mean, we'd still be happy if you reconsidered the decision to to leave the city, <laughs> but <laughs> but if you're not going to um, serve us in that amazing uh, HR capacity, then having some of your voluntary service in this form is is really fantastic. So really glad to see you joining. Um, and uh, Sammy, I uh, I. I don't know you as well, but I am really glad that, you know, to have you being willing to come back and because I think it's, it has been as, as, um, as Vivian and sorry, I know it's confusing. There's two Vivians, but as, as Vivian Lee was just describing like all the kind of work that went into the last four years, you know, I think that we really, we want that institutional continuity, especially with a new institution like this. Um, so it's really great that both of you are, I'm willing to be back. And I, I really appreciated the synopsis of kind of where you guys have been so far and where you might be going. Um, and um, Vivian Lee is, is, you know, one of one of the legends of my district. She's everywhere. She does everything. Um, my uh, I've known about her for my whole life because my grandfather uh, and she worked together on harbor issues. So um, super, super glad to see you in this role. And I think it's really good to have, um, I mean, I just feel like you each bring different expertise to this Commission and, and I'm really glad, Vivian, that you're on with that advocacy lens because, of course, like, you know, we're trying to regulate lobbying here, but it's not to sort of give advocacy to public officials a bad name, right? We know that, like, lots of things that, that are lobbying in a sort of technical sense are also, like, really important information sharing um, and really important to, like, having the right expertise around various like, you know, actions that we might take or the mayor might take. And so I think it's super important to have transparency on that, but also super important not to denigrate, um, you know, the activity of people coming to their elected officials and saying, hey, here's some things you should know about this very particular situation. Um, very sorry. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'm thrilled about this panel and I'm, I'm not coming with a bunch of hard hitting questions, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I do think that um, I would love to, just a thing I'd love to flag, um, well, two things, uh, a, a sort of flag and a question. The flag would be, I would love if the commission, um, you know, if favorably voted on by the council, et cetera, and you all take your seats, I would love if you would think a little bit about what might be the right juncture and the right format to kind of brief the council about the lobbying um, uh, ordinance and specifically kind of like who's covered and who isn't because it's really good to hear that the folks who we sort of who sort of know that they're covered that you're getting that 99 percent compliance like re-registration all of that that's fantastic it occurs to me that as a counselor i probably am occasionally interacting with folks who actually maybe should be covered by this but don't know about it they're showing up maybe for the first time to lobby the city um and i feel like without playing gotcha it could be nice for me and my colleagues to be like, oh, by the way, have you filed the lobbying forms? You should do that. Here's the link. Um, but I, I don't feel I don't feel myself. And I imagine it's also true for colleagues. Like I'm 100 percent clear on sort of like who falls in that bucket. And, and I just think it would be nice for the council, because, of course, like we know if people are lobbying us. <laughs> definitionally right so um so it just seems like we could be good ambassadors for getting everybody into the system um and I, I, so any thoughts you have on that slash just to kind of ask for that to be something that you work on in the coming months um and circle back with us on and then the other thing is just and i won't steal too much of michael's thunder but i know that in the process of figuring out what was workable with the clerk's office that there has been some discussion about whether there was anything that should get tweaked in the original ordinance to try to make things just like clearer and more streamlined. So 
if any of you had comments on that today, particularly the returning commissioners, I'd be happy to hear them. Um, but also happy to have that be, you know, wait till the till a later conversation with the council either way. Um, so those would be my kind of if anybody has comments on that. But I think this is a really stellar slate, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and let you guys. Uh, if you would like to each individually answer, if only one or two of you need to answer, I don't. You know, you don't all have to repeat what somebody else has said. But it sounds like you're ready to sort of respond to that. So I'm gonna let you take the lead on it. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to comment, uh, Councilor Bach. I think that's an excellent flag and an excellent question. You know, on the first about you know thinking about way to you know brief the council. Um, your, your comment is exactly right. It's it's the folks that are being lobbied are in the best position to enforce the the ordinance in the first instance, or at least educate someone coming in about the requirement to register and file the quarterly reports. Um, you know, first I'll, I'll point to a couple of things we have done, and and perhaps the, those are things that we can we can provide if there's a way to do so after <clears throat> the hearing today. For, first, on the uh, city count on the sorry the uh, city clerk's lobbying website, you'll find our regulations, and we went to great lengths to actually use the regulations to quit to clarify who's covered, the type of activity that is covered. I recall very early on in the discussions, there was a lot of confusion over, well, what about technical consultants that come with individuals who are lobbying? Are the technical consultants who are maybe joining a lobbyist but are gonna have, say, project plans or walk through a complicated environmental issue from a technical perspective? Are they required to register as well because they're supporting that effort? So in our regulations, we cover you know, what is a technical, you know, technical person and how that might be distinct or different from the requirement uh, to register as a lobbyist. So that's a great resource. The other is we prepared a memo that went out to all city employees to at least at a high level talk about uh, what is, you know, what is lobbying, who are lobbyists, what's covered, and where can city employees look to see if someone has registered or is unregistered and if they have registered, whether they've identified this particular issue that they're lobbying on or not. And all of that is uh, provided on the Analyze Boston uh, website. Um, but you know, I'll say two things. First, we're always happy to give trainings or briefings. And so if it makes sense to do a training for council members or a training for uh, council staff, uh, we are more than happy to put that together. And, and I'm sure uh, I'll certainly volunteer myself to you know, uh, put, it, put in the time and, and provide that training and answer any questions that there may be um, from any of the counselors or any of the counselor's staff. I will say one of our uh, big goals, um, if, if, we, uh, if we're reappointed, is to now start focusing on public facing education. We've done, I think, a good job educating the folks at City Hall who are policing it. Um, but now I think we really need to spend more time uh, doing some public facing education and we've actually been thinking about and working on uh, uh, a, uh, a webinar that actually we're working with uh, some students over at urban edge on uh, perhaps putting that together for us so it kind of serves as a you know an internship project for them and something that we can actually use as a public facing education um, to your to your second question about you know are there changes or tweaks that we've thought of you know, I'll say I've always viewed our responsibility as carrying out the legislative intent. And so we don't get too much into the weeds on what changes we would make, but how do we implement and enforce this ordinance? You know, I'll, I'll flag three things that I think we've heard about um, and we would defer to the council, but we're happy to provide our experiences and any follow up, you know, conversations. I think one is the frequency of reporting uh, under the state law. Lobbyists file uh, biannual reports under the city ordinance. Lobbyists file quarterly reports, and um, I, we've you know we've heard complaints about the frequency of reporting. Uh, I, I have no opinion on whether that's too frequent or infrequent, but we, you know that's something we've heard. The other we've heard is uh, the issue about convictions. If an individual has been convicted under state crime. Uh, there is a bar under a lobbying ordinance. There isn't similar language as to federal convictions. Uh, that's played out in a high profile Supreme Judicial Court case this year. Um, and you know, at some point, perhaps that you know may affect us. And we'll need to think about whether that merits consideration. And then finally, something that we heard a lot about during the comment period 
that we couldn't address because we didn't think that we were empowered to under the ordinance as it's written is whether there are some, you know, de minimis exceptions. So there are people who engage in lobbying or a neighborhood group that is doing advocacy. Um, is there work such that, geez, they're not really at City Hall talking about too many things, or perhaps they are advocating, but there's no money being spent towards that's considered a lobbying expenditure. Is there a de minimis exception? So some people don't need to register because they're not engaged in enough lobbying to trigger that. Uh, that is something that we heard through common period. We take no opinion on it, um, but it's not something that is currently uh, authorized under the ordinance. Those are the things that you know. I think I flagged as uh, perhaps may may one day be on the table, and and I'm happy in any follow up conversations to uh, talk through the feed specific feedback we've received and how we've worked through those issues to date. And I just want to add, we carry out. The we enforce the legislation that you, the council, have adopted. So as Sammy's indicated, we're not rewriting what, you know, might have to be changed or want to be changed or what the public might say. Um, at some point, there may come a time where maybe city council wants to relook at this. And then we would then obviously enforce whatever you adopt. But we've, you know, whenever there's an issue, we actually go back to, you know, the to, to the legislation that you adopted. And we then say, okay, based on that, we are only allowed to do X, Y, and Z. So we are very much the, the enforcement arm of whatever you pass. And so at some point in the future, in a different scenario, we may wanna, you know, if you decide to re-examine the legislation and such, um, I think we would have some suggestions, of, as Sammy's indicated, that have been brought to our attention, or you know, based on some legis some court decision that's been made. You know, is this clear? So, on the commission is, of course, the city council president as well. So, we do have that legislative interaction, of course, and also city clerk. So, we do try to interpret, understand as best as we can what was intended at the time that the ordinance was adopted. But, you know, it's been four years now. There are new counselors. There may be different issues that, you know, you might want to look at in the future. And I think, as Sam has indicated, we can then provide you some background information in terms of what we've heard from the public and also from the lobbyists as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Bach. If you have any anything that you feel like you would still like. No, just just thank you so much. I really appreciate those comments from both of the returning members. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really excited for Ms. Leonard to get on as well. And uh, yeah, and, and I very and very much appreciate the point. Um, you know, we're, we legislate and you guys implement um, and uh, and that is an important distinction. Um, at the same time, you know, everything that we legislate is is only a dead letter if we don't have people of goodwill um, and good capability who are implementing it. Um, so it means a tremendous amount for us to have you guys actually breathing life into this commission. Um, and I think certainly that the council, you know, to the extent that we are ever opening this back up again for any exchanges, small and large, would want your guys's input just on um, the things that you've learned along the way. So I uh, really appreciate that. And I think those are all my questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilor Bach. Councilor Flaherty, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And that's why I'll pick up kind of Council Block had sort of left off. Uh, first of all, good morning, everyone. Good to see everyone. Uh, Sammy, obviously, we, you were the case of first impression. We worked closely when I was the chair of government ops and sort of creating this uh, along with Vivian Lee. So it's uh, and Vivian Leonard, great to see you back. Um, and the fact that you're back volunteering with a tremendous amount of experience uh, as someone who knows the city and its employees probably better than anybody. Um, it's always good to see you and Vivian for the great work you've done. Um, with the help of cleaning up Boston Harbor, which is an absolute jewel and all the port related activities and businesses down there. So it's also good to have you back. I think we uh, lost you to Pittsburgh for a little while. So it's uh, always good to see you and, and Vivian and Sammy. And I always happen to think very much like CPA, having a, a, a legal perspective is always very helpful. That was very helpful to the CPA as it was getting uh, its legs underneath it. Uh, we had uh, um, uh, Matt Kiefer was very helpful at Goulston as serving in a volunteer capacity. So. We appreciate the volunteerism. We appreciate your commitment to, to this very important and specific issue. And, um, and I, I just have a couple of questions. And Sammy, you do remember we wanted to get it on the books, right? So 
there was some somewhat of a rush to kind of get it on the books because we wanted to have something in place. Um, and we knew that eventually as, you know, as it worked, the, as we worked the kinks out of it, we may be looking to make some changes. So uh, I know the clerk's office initially was inundated. There were portal issues. I assume that the portal issues have been um, have been resolved. There's also questions and concerns as to whether or not reporting four times a year was was too onerous and really like to get your perspective. Nobody else does that. Uh, most folks either do once a year or they'll do twice a year. We're requiring four times a year. Um, shifting gears to maybe what Sammy was sort of alluding to, because that was the conundrum we had initially. Arguably, and I'm here the longest, and I'm also citywide, I get lobbied more by organizations and um, nonprofits and uh, activists. Many of that, many, some of those activists, arguably most of, are being paid in some capacity. And so we remember, if you remember saying, we sort of took this at initially say, hey, let's get this going and then see how it rolls out in every single issue, the chair and my colleagues will contest, particularly the hot button ones, we do get um, lobbied pretty aggressively uh, by groups and organizations that are technically not the typical sort of lobbyists that I think that this was geared towards. Um, and when you think about the business that takes up, takes place up at the state house, that's really lobby heavy. And I would argue that, you know, it's not as heavy at the city level. Uh, we clearly deal with municipal issues and we're dealing with constituents, et cetera. And we deal with policy issues and home rules, et cetera. But, um, but lobbying isn't as intense at the Boston City Council at the city hall level as it is up at Beacon Hill up at the state house. And I can attest to that because I'm, I'm here the longest and I do talk to colleagues up there. And sometimes you go up there and there's a line of lobbyists literally out, out <laughs> a, a rep or senator's door waiting to get some time with them. At City Hall, it's more often than not, it's a it's an organization that's their activists uh, being it together. There's um, there's nonprofits involved. So want to get your perspective, that, particularly those that are receiving some form of compensation, either from the organization that they're working from, a nonprofit, or they have another entity that's paying into a specific organization or outfit, and then they have sort of their disciples uh, pounding the doors of city councils. At, at what point does it cross the line? Uh, we saw we saw heavy influence and in, 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 in activity around the redistricting that we had gone through. Uh, we've seen them heavily around a lot of the housing issues, um, and uh, we've had a number of other ordinances that the council has worked closely with. Uh, interesting enough, like we just did uh, a whole sort of reorg um, around um, urban renewal and, and the BRA. I didn't get I didn't get a single phone call. I didn't get a single phone call from an attorney or from a developer, or from an architect, or from an engineer, or from a representative of all the above, not a single phone call. Yeah. And it was pretty significant action that the Boston City Council took. However, my phone rang off the hook, and I received a number of emails from a variety of different groups and organizations uh, that were sort of rallying together, some of whom are paid in some capacity, uh, otherwise they wouldn't be doing it. And there's others obviously that are just pure volunteers. They're in everything for, uh, reasons around, you know, protecting the quality of life in their community. And we get sort of lobbied regularly almost on on Tuesdays uh, for the Zoning Board of Appeal days, but that's more from an abutter. That's from the guy that lives the street over. Or that's from someone that is concerned about, you know, increased uh, parking or construction uh, disruption. So anyways, I'm sort of throwing a lot on the plate. I, I really like to take this opportunity in addition to uh, uh, clearly, I, and I fully support uh, all of the all of the applicants here. Um, Sammy coming back, I think is very helpful as well as Vivian Lee to have some con continuity and uh, and then obviously having uh, Vivian let it come in and her experience. Um, I think it's gonna be extremely helpful as we take sort of the lobbying um, ordinance to maybe the next level, or at least we've worked out the kinks and uh, you folks get to at least um, participate in, in uh, and enjoy the great work uh, that you've done. And before you hand it off to say another uh, you know, someone that will come down the road uh, and, and take over and be, and be great stewards. So with that, um, I support all the all, all the nominations. I'll get that out of the way. And I appreciate the work you do. But if we could just double back on whether or not four times a year is too onerous and too burdensome and does it kind of burden and, and bog the clerk down when unnecessarily when now that we're up and running, do we really need to be doing four times a year? Could we scale it back to two and accomplish the same result? I'll hear from the experts on that portal issues, I just need to know that those are resolved. And then sort of this conundrum of what is considered a lobbyist and who's getting paid and who's pounding on the doors and asking for meetings. Um, I think that 
that description is a little gray when it comes to to City Hall, and I've just outlined a couple of areas where everywhere, every time you turn around, there was a uh, there was a there was an organization, or there was an activist, or there was a community-based nonprofit. No no lobbyist per se, no lawyer advocating on behalf of a group. Do they come down? 100%. Uh, but more often than not, councilors are being lobbied by sort of a different type of lobbyist, and I don't know whether or not we've addressed that. And I would concur that there are 13 members of the city council, six of them are brand new. They're literally in the first year of their first term. So to Vivian Lee, or through, I think it was Council Bach had recommended maybe some type of tutorial. Um, I had several councilors yesterday ask me why I, why the last several weeks I've filed um, an amendment to an ordinance that we had. And I, I, I always do it last minute and I did it that same day. That's how you're supposed to do it because we're bound by the open meeting law. I don't have the luxury of floating my amendment a week in advance and start grabbing six, seven, you know, whipping votes in the hallways. Others may do that. I don't do that. I have to file it in accordance with Robert's rules of order and uh, the council rules as well as the charter. So I'm trying to follow the rules. And then I learned that I got colleagues that are expecting this document in advance so that they can read it and make a decision as opposed to making the decision on the fly, which is kind of how it's designed when you're kind of filing an amendment, because again, you can't with votes. So we had one yesterday, Council Royo did, great, did a great job as the chair, hearing, working session, listening session. And then as I was looking at the legislation, getting feedback from, from constituents and uh, across the city, I decided to file um, uh, an amendment to that document. And I had three or four colleagues saying, geez, I, I, I like this. I could actually support this, but it's kind of coming in late. I wish I had a little more time to noodle it and talk to some, some folks and some supporters. So as a result of which it didn't pass, but Again, a lot of things kind of happen fast and, and loose at times, but to Council Box suggestion, I think that some type of, um, you know, and I could even, I would even be willing, we have these Wednesday luncheon series. I would even be happy to host um, the, lobby, the lobbying commission to come down and just introduce yourself to the newest members and just educate them on sort of what's lobbying, what's not lobbying, when there's a gray, when there's a cross the line. I think it would be very helpful because the council president has had to do that a number of times this year with council rules and Robert's rules of order and decorum and all those things, because I guess it's been a significant change. Unlike past, when I came on the council, just two members came on with me. You had senior members that could kind of show you the ropes. We had significant change out of a 13 member body, six of them are brand new. And I believe two or three others were only in their second term. Mm -hmm. So I've had, you know, I'd say a super majority of the council are arguably still kind of learning the ropes in learning, you know, the building and who's what and where's where. And so I think that'd be extremely helpful. So I know I'm just going to put a lot up there, but uh, four times a year, do we really need to do it four times a year? Um, and um, have we learned anything? And can, can we help you, you know, make those necessary changes by ordinance, uh, which is, I always say, keep it simple, get it on the books, let's work out the kinks. And then if we need to make some adjustments that can be done uh, by working obviously with the council. So if there's anything now that you say, hey, you know what? We missed this when we out oh, when we when we when we put this forward. Or you know what? Something that's popped up kind of here and there that we probably should address. It's not a huge issue, but you know, we didn't really anticipate that. I think now's the time through the chair to kind of let us know, in addition to your applications and your nominations, which I wholeheartedly support. I would also welcome the feedback to say, did we miss anything here? Should we add something? Should we scale something back? Uh, that's that's it for me. And I, again, Sammy and, and both Vivians, I Appreciate all of you and your time and attention and uh, your commitment to our city and your commitment to this very important issue. Is, uh, it's a, and I, I had a front row seat, as you know, Sammy, and going back and forth, ping ponging between the administration and the clerk's office. And I really felt bad we were doing something that was going to almost be a tsunami to the clerk's office. But I'm fortunate that uh, based on what I'm hearing, I think that those kinks have been worked out. So thank you all. Thank, thank you, Councilor. I, you know, I first want to, I just first want to say that on the yeah training, um, I we're really happy to make ourselves available, and, and perhaps after the you know hearing today, I'll reach out to the city clerk and see if we can actually start coordinating that. Um, more more than happy to do that uh, at at the councils or subcommittees, you know, earliest convenience. On the on the portal questions, I'll say that you know I, the kinks have been worked out. Um, I, I do think it was a tsunami at the beginning, but the portal actually seems to be working really well. I I don't don't know if you caught it you know earlier on in the in the hearing today, but um, you know if I think for the first time since maybe this started, we have just close to a hundred percent 
compliance uh, for the ordinance as far as you know reporting follow on following registration um, and that's you know that's incredible and so I think you know from a technological perspective the filing perspective those uh, those kinks have been worked out on the on the, the quarterly reporting piece you know I think we heard early on that it was onerous um, that those complaints they haven't been lodged in a while I do not know if because that people still feel that way and just they felt like they made they said their piece or if in fact it's no longer onerous uh, I know from the city clerk's office they you know they've worked out the kinks and I think it's really a staff capacity question whether it would open them up to do other things if there was biannual reporting as opposed to quarterly but, you know but this is what I'll say I think I think this is one of those things we're happy to double back on and in fact um, you know, I, I'd be more than happy to commit the commission to, you know, noticing and, you know, a listening session soon just to say, you know, hey, we want to, we're not, we're not necessarily proposing a rule change. Mm -hmm. We we'll hold a listening session just to hear from folks who are actually doing the registration. How do you feel about, you know, the, the quarterly reporting versus biannual reporting? If, if we did it biannual, you know, what, what would that look like? How, what, how would you benefit if we kept it as is? You know what are what are the drawbacks? What are the benefits? So you know, I think uh, love to follow up on this and see. Perhaps we do a listening session. Maybe it's a joint listening session. Yeah. I think that's a great. I think that's a great idea, Sammy. And um, the, what I'm hearing is that it's like, yeah, you can't you, you can't fight city hall. So it is what it is. So and you never really want to have that situation. We want to make sure it's good and it works for everybody. But the feedback I've been getting is that the four times a year is still somewhat onerous. Okay. And they've kind of you said they've sort of spoke their piece, but their attitude is, ah, you know, you can't fight City Hall and you don't want to get into quagmire, you're representing clients and you got other things that you got to focus on. But uh, I think a, a listening session or, hey, you know, how can this be better? Or can we get some honest feedback without any sort of penalties or punitive piece to the to the folks that are asking? I think you that would be, that would, I think it would be healthy, frankly. Yeah. And I wish, I wish more people and more departments did offer that. So that's a great, great suggestion. Yeah, and I think we would learn a lot about other parts of the ordinance and the regs as well. And then, you know, just I, I just want to quickly double back on a point you were making about, you know, I'm hearing from you know nonprofits and advocates, and you know, it, are they registering, and and how does this apply to them? And and this is what I'll say, and I think this actually just gets to the heart of education as opposed to the ordinance and changes that need to be made itself. The ordinance is broad; um, it doesn't actually distinguish between types right. of lobbyists. It actually says, you know, if you're advocating for an administrative action, a legislative action, or an executive action, either through, you know, proposing legislation or vetoing legislation or amending legislation, that's considered lobbying activity. Um, it's tough because so many people have given the term lobbyist a certain meaning or a look, right. uh, but right. you know, the way the city of Boston defines lobbying, I think it's broad to include that, you know, that, you know, advocacy that we see in the halls of city hall, including, you know, nonprofits, neighborhood groups, uh, abutters, you, you, you name it. I, I, really what the ordinance does is it actually distinguishes between what's considered lobbying activity and what's not, as opposed to who's doing it. You know, whether it's, you know, ABC, LLC, or just, you know, an individual who lives at, you know, some, some address within the city of Boston. And right. so I think, I think it's an education component because the ordinance even says, you can be considered a lobbyist even if you are an uncompensated volunteer of a nonprofit organization right. who's advocating for something that you know would be considered uh, a lobbying activity. So I think it's an education piece, um, both public facing but also internal to say, listen, if you're hearing from these people, just because they're not identifying themselves to you as a lobbyist or they're not a you know a member of this firm or that firm, they may still have a registration requirement, and you should check that before you, you know you're meeting with someone or right. or entertaining um, communication. So to me, I think uh, education is a way to resolve this issue. But then, of course, if if you know if we're unhappy with that outcome, that interpretation of the ordinance, right? That's an ordinance issue more so than a how it's implemented issue. And I, I would add that uh, one of the things we discussed was if there's a public hearing like this and someone speaks on an issue or before the planning agency, and they're speaking at a public hearing, that is not lobbying per se, because that's the public comment period, right? So that's different than if someone reaches out to you and says, well, let's do this, this, and that. And we were very clear, based on what the legislation said, as Sammy said, lobbying can also be, lobbying we normally think about as legislation. However, it could be an administrative 
action as well, right? So if, um, you know, on the side, you're talking to someone on the zoning board or something, that would also be considered lobbying, even though it is not legislative. It is an administrative action. You know, I used to be on the Conservation Commission. If someone was coming and sort of calling me and such, that would also be considered lobbying because it would influence action that was being done at the city right. level. So that's, however, if you were to speak at the Conservation Commission's hearing at their meeting where it's public and such on, you know, a particular issue, because it's publicly noticed, because it's, you know, everyone can see, that would not per se be considered lobbying. So right. those are some of the nuances that we actually right. went through as we were implementing. You know, the first, first year or two was setting up the whole system and working with city clerk, but then we really got into the nuances for exactly the reason that you said, Councillor, because people were asking us, well, I testified at the you know conservation commission here. Do I now have to register? Well, that's a publicly noticed meeting. So, you know, the transparency is there. That's right. different than right. calling right. me at home and, you know, and saying, well, can you do this, this, and this when you vote? You know, so we really did try to think about all these things. But I think, you know, as Sammy says, a listening session right. potentially with you would, would be very right. bad. So, so on that line, line Vivian, you know, maybe this is probably better for Sammy in terms of we just went through sort of an exhaustive uh, redistricting process and and arguably the NAACP and the Chinese Progressive Association and other activist groups, they, they kind of took the process over and um, they had a tremendous amount of influence, but they also were putting a lot of pressure uh, on members of the council to you know, select a certain map or to vote a certain way, and so. But again, I guess under the guise of, or under this legislation, I guess they didn't have to register, or they maybe they should have registered. But again, colleagues wouldn't necessarily maybe be able to differentiate between that and sort of a proponent or a lawyer, a lobbyist coming in on behalf of a, a company or a developer looking to advance some type of uh, regulation or or some policy through the city. I I, I put it all in the same bucket. If someone's asking you to vote a certain way or someone's putting pressure on you to do something, I think that's lobbying. And during that process, as well as other processes, I don't want to just sort of single out the redistricting, but but every time you turned around, it was someone from the CPA, someone from the NAACP, some other activist group, you know, can, can I talk to you about this map? Can I talk to you about that map? And oh, can you look at my, they all, they had their own maps and they pretty much took the process over. And I'm here 20 years, I've been through three of those redistrictings. I've never seen anything like it before, but uh, neither here nor there. I, I felt that that was lobbying. Um, I think it would qualify under the definition of lobbying, yet um, they didn't have to register with the clerk. So, you, you know, I guess think they were registered. You do not think they were registered? I don't think they registered. If they are registered, they put, I don't think they registered for that specific event, which was the redistricting process. We had a number of hearings and we had working sessions and listening sessions, and we also went out into the neighborhood. But at every step of the way, you know, a handful of organizations pretty much took the process over. There's no other way to explain it, but um, obviously we, the city council uh, elected representatives of the people, we're in a representative government and we got a committee structure, um, but that process, as well as some some others that we've seen over the years kind of, it kind of sort of takes a life of its own. And, and But it's the, it's the, it's those organizations, it's the, it's the activist and the influence that they're putting and the pressure they're putting on members of the council, which in fact, determine sometimes how a councilor will vote on something. You'll have something on the merits, the council will actually ignore the merits, but because of the, the just the, the overwhelming pressure from you know organizations within that particular area or district or demographic, they tend to, they'll just go with that because they just, they're getting pressure. And it's, the pressure's real. Um, and we even had a situation that, you know, on, on, on a piece of legislation yesterday that there was significant pressure on both ends of the spectrum you know, to try to get folks to get to the middle. Um, and ultimately it was, you know, could be viewed as a somewhat of a compromise, but there was there was a lot of pressure. Uh, there was a lot of pressure on both sides of that. And it wasn't administ it wasn't pressure coming from the administration because that's that's inherent and baked in as to strong mayor and council form of government. But this is outside, this is outside influence. Um, and I guess they're not registered lobbyists. Uh, some of them are being compensated uh, for that advocacy and for those positions they're taking. But so I think uh, absolutely we, we need to take a look at that, but we also probably need to have a, a tutorial for, for the newer members, uh, for the existing members, all of us, I guess, but in particular the newer members, so that they can differentiate between, you know, you know what's sort of, you know, what's public advocacy 
in what's lobbying in and what pressure and and uh, you know when does it cross the line into a when does it when does that person or that entity need to register with the clerk um, like everybody else? So that's my two cents on it. Thank you, Sammy and, and Vivian. Yeah, th thank you for that feedback. And I, I agree. I think um, you know ed education on this point, both internal and external, could go a long way in addressing those issues. Right. And, you, and I'll just one one last point. I'll talk to a colleague and I'll say, hey, you know, you know, could you you know could you you know could you support this? This is A, B, and C. Uh, Look, looks really good and I'd really like to do it, but I just I just can't the, the the activists are like, you know, it's just unbelievable. They just won't leave me alone. It's like it's real pressure. My a lot of my colleagues are, are under regular pressure uh, from from groups and organizations within the city. And though even though it's a, you know it's it's good and it's sound and it makes sense, um, they won't vote for it because of the pressure that they're under from a specific entity. It could be a civic association, it could be a community group. Uh, it could be another colleague. I, I get the inter, interworkings of the politics, but more often than not, it will be uh, a tremendous amount, of, tremendous amount of pressure and influence that's bearing down on that member of an elected body, and they're now making a decision based on that pressure, um, just to get the pressure off of them, right? Just ah, they want they, they'll threaten to run someone against me, or they won't support me, or it's real pressure, Sammy and Vivian and Vivian. It's not that the person got a check to advocate for a specific company or a specific project. Um, that pressure is not even pressure. Hey, can, can some, some, a lobbyist stops you in the hallway. Hey, can I talk to you about Bill One? You know, uh, the such and such ordinance. You know, as you're walking to the elevator, and you can give that person your opinion. You don't feel pressure. You take some of the some of the the nonprofits and the, and the civic and the activists. That's that's pressure. They're outside your door. They they follow you to the elevator. They follow you to your car. You know, they've been up, they've been outside my house. They've been outside Chairman Arroyo's house. They've been outside Council of Bach and Council of Flynn's house. There's this whole new way. They come, they come to your house. So at what point are we crossing the line? At what point is it public advocacy and just sort of looking out for things in the neighborhood and protecting quality of life issues? And what time is it? What to, what is it? It's real lobbying, it's real pressure. You know, councilors can't sleep at night. They're torn between, you know, voting yes and no because you got pressure from activists and organizations and groups and many of them being compensated in some capacity. I, I just, we need to flush this out because it, 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 it rears its head every, every week, um, every week at city hall. Yeah. And again, we're in a strong mayor form of government. So you would think that the lobbyists and activists would be more on the other side of the fifth floor and then it would be us and sort of on the way that the structure, but they, they do, they're more active than, than the typical sort of, prototypical lobbyist. So I, I think we I think we as a body and I think we as a city, we need to define and, and, and bring some clarity to that. Because again, it's pressure. Um, you know, a, a paid lobbyist will ask for consideration. Hey, would you consider supporting this? Yeah, I'll consider it. Oh, nah, that's not, okay. And they leave you alone. You're done. They did their job. They asked the question, they got, they're compensated for it. They exit stage left. This other stuff is constant. Yeah. It's swaying opinions. It's swaying votes. It's changing legislation. It's real, and yet those folks don't have to register. They're not considered lobbyists. But yeah, yeah. I think I've, I think I've exhausted it ad nauseum, and my colleagues want to opine on it um, through the chair. But uh, I think we need to. And we didn't address it, Sammy, in the very beginning. We kind of left that off to the side. Say we're going to keep an eye on it. It's pretty intense, and it's regular. It's arguably weekly, and it's pressure that we don't get from lobbyists that are registering. And it's pressure that's changing people's opinions and or their votes and or how they view a particular issue. It's lobbying, but they get to skate. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think what I'm hearing from you is, you know, there there may still be some ambiguity about, you know, again, the ordinance doesn't regulate how you lobby. It just says if you if you engage in any of the following conduct, that's considered lobbying activity. And now you need to register. Um, I think what I'm hearing is, you know, there may be some ambiguity about the types of activities engaged in, whether that's considered lobbying, and if it is, are people registering? And, you know, we're we're ha always happy to look back and say, okay, have we actually put enough meat on these bones in our regulations to define what is and what is not lobbying activity? And I think if, you know, if there are some ambiguities there, and I'm hearing that, you know, perhaps there may be, you know, we're happy to listen and, and take those issues up. 
And there's still a non. I think there's. I think we put a nonprofit exemption in. If I'm re, if I'm remember, remembering it quickly, I don't have it in front of me, but no, I, we, no, there isn't a nonprofit exemption. Okay, good. All um, right. It, there, it, you know, there again. What it says is, it, it distinguishes lobbying and whether you have to register based on the activities you engage in. So, for example, you know, an easy low-hanging fruit one that's easy to explain is just that you know, if you're if you're advocating for a decision in a public hearing. So, if I'm appearing on behalf of a client in front of the City of Boston Zoning Board, uh, pursuant to a public hearing, I don't have to register. But if I'm Got, you know, asking for a private meeting to discuss, hey, what do you need us to do on this project uh, for us to really make it more streamlined before, you know, this and that or this or the other board, that that's different. Now I'm now I'm having a meeting with the intention of trying to get an administrative action, you know, either on behalf of myself or on behalf of someone else. You know, that's that's activity. There isn't a nonprofit exemption, but perhaps a lot of the conduct that nonprofits might be engaging in are covered under one of those things that are considered not lobbying activities. Um, but yeah, to, to clarify, I mean, the way we see it is if you're advocating for administrative, legislative, or executive action, and it does not fit under one of the, these are not lobbying activities, you know, nonprofit, for-profit, or somewhere in between, you have to register. Okay. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you as well. I see Councilor Bach, you have your hand up. To, just a quick clarification on that point, Sammy, is there, and I'm sorry, I should just pull the legislation up, but is there a um, significance attached to whether you're being paid for that? No, no the, the, the ordinance is actually very clear. There's a line in there that says, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you may still have to register even if you're an uncompensated volunteer member of an organization. So again, if you are advocating for administrative, legislative, executive action, even if you're uncompensated uh, and you're not engaging in what is considered a not lobbying activity, activity uh, you have to you have to register and report. And I think this gets to why we heard from some people during the public hearing process. Again, I have no opinion on how you do it, but what we heard is um, people advocating for a de minimis exemption, meaning you know, okay, maybe we're not you know I'm not being personally compensated, but we're not spending a lot of resources to lobby, we're only on this specific issue, and maybe we don't have to register because you know we're kind of in and out on one issue when this issue is gone, we're not gonna be at City Hall anymore advocating on you know this issue or any other issue. Uh, but the way we read the ordinance, it doesn't authorize the de minimis exemption. In fact, I've, the language sounds fairly clear that if you're engaging in activity, you're registering, you know, no, no exceptions to that. Um, uh, I think where, that's where something like that could come in or be considered. We heard that through the public hearing process, but no, there isn't a um, there isn't a, any kind of exemption for uncompensated folks. In fact, the ordinance very clearly states that even if you're uncompensated, you could be considered a lobbyist. Yeah, so I, I think my takeaway is that the order of operations should be like we, you know, we should have a briefing with the council. Mike was kind to offer his. Um, lunch slot potentially, but you know, find time to kind of give people a sense of this and let counselors ask a bunch of questions about, well, wait, would this situation probably fall under it or whatever? And then I think it, that enables us to both be good ambassadors about the law as it currently stands. And the law is, that is the law. So I think it's really important that everyone in the building know what those rules are and be able to communicate with folks who maybe don't think that they're covered by this. Hey, I think actually you probably are. So say it better be safe. Like you should do this, go here. You know, we can, we can train our staff on how to direct people to the right stuff there. Um, and, you know, it might even be something where, you know, a lot of us have auto replies that direct people to different staffers for different capacities. After this conversation, I'm like, oh, I could imagine adding something in mind. Like, hey, if you you might, if you think you might be doing municipal lobbying, you might want to register. Here's the link. You know, it's just I think we counselors could be quite helpful on that stuff. And then I also think that us asking about hypotheticals and sort of understanding what it does and doesn't apply to might help us think through whether we want to take legislative action to um, to adjust anything. You know, so. Yeah, and I'll I'll, I'll add to that. I, I like the idea of like a hypothetical potpourri only because um, that helps us tremendously. Uh, to think through situations, you know, just to go back to something we've also done as a commission the last few years is 
when we're confronted with, with a situation that isn't particularly clear, we've actually sat down and prepared advi published advisory opinions. So if you actually go to the Compliance Commission website, you know, we were confronted with the situation of, you know, wait a second, um, under, under the lobbying ordinance, if someone is advocating for procurement to go to some, a particular vendor that's considered lobbying, but then we, you know, we got this hypothetical question of, well, wait a second, what if I've been invited to participate in an interview uh, as part of a competitive procurement? If I'm going in there advocating for my company to get the contract, are we engaging in lobbying activi activity? And I, you know, I thought that was an interesting question. It's not particularly clear in the ordinance. And so we drafted, you know, thought about it, researched it, met at a public hearing and voted to publish an advisory opinion on whether, you know, an RFP, post RFP uh, selection process interview is considered lobbying activity. And so if as a result of our, you know, hypotheticals conversation, there are some really interesting uh, hypos that are not very clear under the ordinance, we're happy to go back and actually put together published advisory opinions put them up on the site and educate folks on those um, uh, discrete situations. And I think related to that, the other example we talked about was if the planning agency asks, asks someone to come in to further explain their project or proposal, that's not lobbying. That is in response to a request for additional information by the agency, different than if the proponent you know, said they wanted to meet with Arthur Jameson. You know, that's a different scenario. So we even thought about that. And then as Sammy indicated earlier, if a consultant, say an engineering firm or a transportation consultant comes in with a proponent at the request of the agency, then again, that is not considered lobbying. So I, you know, we really went in, into a lot of the nuances of, of what might or might not be considered lobbying. And I think we'd be more than willing to share with you our initial thoughts on that. And you might say we were wrong or you, or you want to, you know, clarify that in, in future, future legislation. And that would be helpful to us as well. Thank you for that. Councilor Bach, is that? Sort yep, of sorry, support? sorry, hands down. Uh, and uh, I saw Council President Flynn left. I was going to suggest exactly what Council Flaherty suggested, which is we, we used to do sort of lunches on city council meeting days uh, that were sort of for educational purposes. I think this would be a good um, group to put together to sort of have conversations about who's a lobbyist, what what's, what kind of action, because I think the intention of this when it was passed, and I, I think this was essentially passed before me, though the effectiveness date came in when I first came in in 2020. Right. Um, this thing called COVID happened, and so we never really had any, like, I just remember the clerk uh, having questions about sort of like, the how do I get these things on file? How do I do all of these different things? More of a administrative than uh, the actual sort of language of the ordinance itself um, and defining aspects. I think there there's a benefit to the council to have that conversation so that this doesn't devolve into sort of gotcha enforcement, but rather giving folks the knowledge of the existence of this and that you actually do qualify whether you're because it seems like you can essentially qualify for this even if you're not paid by uh, a, an organization. And I guess often we have instances where organizations might reach out to people who aren't technically members uh, or sort of member adjacent, and they will come with that group and maybe lobby uh, in, a, in a different way without even knowing they're lobbyists because they're just folks responding to a friend's request to come speak to their counselor, right? So um, I think there's a there's an education aspect to this that should be made available, not just to the council. I think it's important for the council to recognize it, uh, but also uh, an education component for the public so that they're aware this even exists. Because as Councillor Flaherty sort of stated, I don't think I've been approached by what we would call a traditional lobbyist, right? If you go to the state house or if you've seen sort of lobbyists in general for, for federal action, like that's a very specific kind of lobby. Um, and because of the work we do at the council, I don't think we receive that kind of lobbying. I think we we can at times, right? I think the Greater Boston Real Estate Board most recently would qualify as sort of that kind of lobbying, but it's not. It's it's very far and few in between. Uh, and I, I know Councilor Flaherty has been here longer, so I don't know if that's a new thing per se, but it's certainly not. We usually are hearing from community groups, community neighborhood organizations, civic organizations, um, nonprofits. 
it's it's rare for us to have sort of the traditional big corporation paid lobbyist outside the door. Um, and so I think that an education thing has to sort of happen with that just so folks understand, you know, what's lobbying, am I a lobbyist, what activity qualifies? Because even on, on the actual sort of, if I remember correctly, the language within the within the final regulations doesn't include public testimony. So in other words, when we when we have a hearing or we have a listening session and folks come and speak at that listening session and bring their organizations, that none of that is actually technically lobbying activity. It, it seems like the ordinance is more geared towards the private interactions. Um, and that I see a lot of head nodding, so I assume that's actually sort of an accurate read. And so because those, yep. I was just gonna say, I, I agree with your, you know, your take on it so far. Yeah, and so I think because the private interactions are better sort of monitored by the actual people being interacted with, I think it makes sense for us to know uh, what what and where it it qualifies or falls. Um, and so that that I think is a two prong situation where I think it's not just because just to sort of re regurgitate things I've heard here. I think there's a good chance that we would all benefit from a council counselor only sort of learning uh, and conversation. I think there's a request here separate and apart from that about a listening session for people impacted where they're coming to you and saying these are the things that I think could be better served. And then I think there's a third prong, which is you as an organ, you as sort of a board or the council or however, or in, in conjunction, an education plan outwardly to folks who may not even know that this falls on them. And so for me, those are three separate sort of things that we should probably look at trying to do uh, if we really want this to work effectively. Because I also remember uh, Clerk Feeney, his major issue was like that we require four for registrations and this is a like we have to create new databases and so it sounds like we got a lot of that um administrative work done we figured out how to sort of streamline a lot of that or get that done in an efficient manner but i think now we have to do some of the more um outward work so that's inward work that was our work as a as a government to put that stuff together now we have to let other individuals know what's going on so uh <coughs> councilor Bach, i know your hand went up on that and then yeah, councilor Cloudy, I'll go back to you. great yeah great summation um that ties it all up together. And, and, uh, and as a reference and uh, uh, council Bark alluded to it, I think, I, I don't know if I'm in the next, uh, I have a, like a, one of those luncheon series, I, I, I when it's the next Wednesday or next few Wednesdays. So I don't know if through Sammy or Vivian or Vivian, how you want to communicate it, but I'm happy to host. So basically after the council meeting on a Wednesday, each councilor has an opportunity to host a luncheon and bring in a group to kind of just, you know, uh, council Roy, I think brought someone in on, um, um, Basically, uh, trying to get um, have like research. So he had a researcher come in and yep. Uh, talk about this. So, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so each one just to give an example. But yeah, right, Council Clark, you 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 currently have May twenty fourth. Okay, is that That's far time. down the road or when whatever? I can maybe swap with someone. I, I, I yeah. didn't even know these were assigned this way. Yours, <laughs> yours is December sixth. So yours isn't for ages. I mean, also Councilor Flaherty. I don't know whether you know. Obviously, like. The ones that are coming up soonest are Lujan, Mejia, Worrell. I, if people may not have plans yet, in which case. Yeah, I could I either offer to swap. Way. Yeah, I could either yeah, offer like, to I already swap. swap I, I'm doing one in April. I have a plan for it, but I already okay. and I swapped with Baker to get right. that slot. So so, so I'm, I'm offering if we can figure we can work our schedules great. And then just uh, lastly, uh, Councilor Arroyo, because I, I think like the Greater Boston Real Estate Board, that may, might be a good example. We just had that issue, uh, the, the vote yesterday. Greater Boston Real Estate Board, I assume that they've registered um, and they put uh, they put money behind a campaign around it. I don't know whether or not the S Small Property Owners Association registered, but I know that City Life didn't. And I can tell you out of all three of those branches, City Life, Kind of advocated the most. They attended the hearings. They sent us all a, a 400 uh, letters asking us to vote but, a certain but way. In but in fairness, but in fairness, Michael, that the the letters and the speaking at the hearing doesn't count as lobbying, right? That's like yeah, no, those, yeah, those are the volunteers within the organization. Yeah. But, but there's certainly folks who, are in favor of the rent stabilization provision, were coming to folks' offices and and doing more traditional yeah, lobbying. Yeah, no, 100. percent So the Red Red Real Estate Board had to register. SPOA may or may not have. City Light didn't, or may or may not. So it's it's. I think this is timely. With everything I, think also, I think there's also a question does is there a union exception to this 
There, there, there isn't, and in fact, there, are, there are unions that are registered. Uh, there's one, there's one exception that's union related, which is this. So, if um, if a union representative is uh, engaging in a collective bargaining negotiation with the city, those collective bargaining negotiations are not considered lobbying activity. So that wouldn't trigger it. But if a union representative is, you know, at you know meeting with one of you to discuss. Uh, legislation that is pending that's considered lobbying and would require registration. In fact, many unions are registered. And the that only, and at, at our last meeting, the only applicant that had not filed, had not uh, filed their report was one of the unions, which I think has subsequently been taken care of. We should be at 100% now. It was 99% when we had our last meeting and, and it was actually a union. Um, and the, the, uh, the rep, had been away or on leave or something. So there was a reason for it. So, so they, other than what Sammy said, they are required to register. Yeah. Well. And it sounds like our unions are in, are in good compliance. It, it seems so. I mean, you know, obviously this goes back to enforcement and, and education, which is, you know, for us as volunteer members, you know, we, at least I, uh, I'll, I will admit, I don't, Vivian and Vivian may actually have this down, but I, I do not know every union that the city interacts or is in collective bargaining agreements with. I know that there are unions registered, but I don't know about the existence of other unions who are not on that list. And that, you know, that that's where kind of education and everyone really being a team and when it comes to enforcement is so important because, you know, you all or uh, any of our, you know, offices and departments within the city may be aware of certain organizations that are coming in uh, that that we may not be um, that are not registered. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I think all I can say is, you know, yes, um, there is, you know, unions to the extent that they're advocating for, you know, policies or legislation do have to register. And I can also say, you know, yes, that there are unions who are registered and are complying with the quarterly reporting requirement. Yeah, and it sounds like in some ways this goes further in, than some of the state laws on their own lobbying at the state house in the sense that I'm not sure the state considers sort of community organizations necessarily at like lobbyists. I know, but they have a different sort of ebb and flow to who's actually on their doorstep, right? So, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll say generally speaking, the city's ordinance is much broader than the state lobbying statute. On a okay. for for several reasons, including the types of lobbyists, the state does have a de minimis exemption, and the state doesn't require you know as frequent as reporting as the city oh. does. Yeah, and I think that that second prong of sort of having people impacted talk to us about where we could be better. I think that addressing why it's different, whether those differences make sense to continue to have, or whether there's ways to edit some of that language to make it more specific and tighter to what what we're dealing with in, in, a, in a good way, I think is probably a good step. So I think my action steps coming out of this is I'll talk to uh, Council President Flynn and see what the possibility of having you come in, whether for it's a Wednesday session or perhaps it's a virtual, we've had virtual sort of um, administration, but we just recently had one on immigration uh, impacts on the city of Boston. And so some way to have the council present for an informational session um, and, and sort of going over it. Uh, because I think for many of the newer uh, council counselors, and I am technically a newer counselor, I'm in my second year and my second term, but we have, I think, six or five first term counselors. This is likely the first time they would actually even engage with this. Um, and so I think it makes sense to have that. So I think that should be sort of priority. And then I think there's a secondary folks who are already in, enrolled, folks who already know that they apply to this have had sort of, um, they, they're they're aware to its user friendliness, I guess, if I want to use a, a different word and sort of, sort of where it creates handicaps that maybe we're not intending to do and where we could make it maybe stronger upon hearing sort of those things. And then I think there's a third one, which is an education campaign. And I think that we can figure that out as counselors, how we, we want to engage in that sort of aspect of it. But I think the commission itself, um, I don't know what resources you have available to you for that kind of like, so for instance, if we asked you to um, put together uh, a video series, maybe, or like several videos or, or a web page, like what, what resources do we have available from the commission sort of itself to deal with that? Yeah, well, you know, I'll say that, um, 
you know, the Department of Information Technology and the city clerk's office have been wonderful in facilitating kind of any outreach we want to do. You know, they've, they've been doing that. So we do have a website. There's a lot of information on the website about the lobbying ordinance, the regs, our bulletins, reporting, where you can find reports. You know, so that those those mechanisms are there. Um, on kind of other stuff, you know, videos, what have you, you know, we're, 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 we're a scrappy bunch, uh, you know, on, on the kind of outreach, you know, memo writing, letter writing, I, you know, I, I, I spend some of my own volunteer time writing, you know, memos and stuff that Alex, uh, the city clerk can then have uh, be sent out to the, you know, city employees, uh, you know, uh, our former uh, commissioner, uh, Linda Champion, you know, coordinated with a local nonprofit who has a, you know, film editing, uh, internship program to help us put together a webinar. So, you know, we try to leverage what we can find to get the word out. Um, but, but you know, I will say that the city clerk's office and the Department of Information Technology have been really supportive uh, and have facilitated much of, you know, both the kind of the kinks in the technological aspect of this, but also our, our outreach. Thank you. That's helpful. I, I see your hand up, uh, Ms. Leonard, so I want to just give you a chance. Thank you, Counselor. As a point of reference, I just wanted to point out that um, some of the unions do have paid lobbyists. I don't know if the council has experienced meeting or come into contact with any of them. They may operate more at the um, state level or in Washington, D.C. Understood. Uh, and uh, I will just say on my part, uh, I, I'm going to recommend uh, appointment for all of you. Uh, it's and so that's why my questions are more geared towards future actions. Um, but I appreciate you all taking the time to be here with us this morning. I don't want to hold you longer than I have to. Uh, Councilor Flaherty, I see your hand up. Sorry, Mr. Chair, that was from earlier. Just good to see everybody. And I support your uh, your uh, recommendation for passage. And good to see everybody. Thanks I'm for the work. I uh, uh, commend Councilor Flaherty on his Zoom background. That's a very nice. I see the. The French door there looks very good. I like that. Thank That's you. well well positioned. The nice gray. I'll let my wife. I let my wife know the glass is clear. The kids are old enough, so you don't have fingerprints on the glass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We broke so many things in my home, uh, and so I, I think it looks great, uh, Councillor Flaherty. Uh, so you, with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, adjourn us. Uh, I will put this forward on Wednesday, uh, our next Wednesday council meeting. I will recommend uh, the reappointment and appointment of folks uh, on this board. So thank you right. uh, very much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you. 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 Thank you.